Welcome to the online gathering of the Grace Life Church. My name is Christy Bird, and I want to say thank you for joining us today. Right now, if you would go ahead and like this video and share it with your friends, we believe that today's service will be an encouragement to you and to them. So share. If this is your first time tuning in to the Grace Life Service, we wanted to extend a warm welcome to you and your family. We hope that we can meet you soon in person. If you want to find out more information about our church, you can go to thegracelifechurch.org. Parents, I want to encourage you to make sure your kids have the resources that they need for today's Kid Life lesson. And also for the sermon from Pastor Matt. You can find today's resources at thegracelifechurch.org forward slash family discipleship. Also, one of the things that we miss about gathering together in person on Sunday is being able to sing together. So here's Pastor Ben on why you and your family should sing together during our online gatherings. Hey Grace Life, I just want to take a few minutes to talk with you about the importance of singing during these online Sunday mornings. At the moment, it's so hard to make connections with people because we're separated. Even though we can talk on the phone or do video chat, it's just not the same. This is especially true when trying to sing together. But the church needs to sing praises and express themselves via music as a part of continuing worship of God. Music has always been a part of the life of God's people. The first mention of musical instruments is early in Genesis 4, uh, and his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all as such as handled the harp and organ. We see uh, in Genesis 31 that Laban laments not being able to sing over his family when Jacob leaves. Um, we know that Moses and Miriam sang songs in Exodus 15 when uh, God had delivered his people out of Egypt. Um, and the Bible even has a whole book devoted to songs, right? The Psalms. Every human emotion can be found in it, and these songs were well known by the Israelites. Even some of the songs we sing today are based on the Psalms. And don't miss this either. Even Jesus and his disciples sang. After the Last Supper in Matthew 26, 30, we can read, When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So I want to encourage you to sing in this time, because this is a work of the Spirit. Ephesians 5, 15 to 21 tells us, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Music helps us to express and experience emotions on a deeper level. In 1 Samuel 16, Saul, the first king of Israel, is abandoned by the Spirit of God when David is anointed the next king. And we read that that same David comes as a harpist and is called in to calm Saul's soul. Uh, in verse 23, whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand, and so Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. So sing this morning. Our song today is, Oh Praise the Name, which is a great reminder of Easter every day. We sing to a risen Savior, we sing because of a risen Savior, and we sing because we know in eternity we will sing His praises forever. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus led. Son of hell. 
you're going to decide whether you should or should not do it. So if you should do it, you're going to go to the yes side. If you shouldn't do it, you're going to go to the no side. All right, so let's try this. Mr. Nick's going to help you out. All right, so the first situation is, should you share a toy with a friend? What do you think? Mr. Nick? Yes, that's correct. You do want to share a toy with a friend. All right, good job. All right, back to the middle. All right, next one is, should you talk when your teacher is talking? Yes or no? What do you think? That's correct. That's a no. Good job. All right, back to the middle. A couple more. All right, should you obey your mom and dad? Yes or no? What do you think, Mr. Nick? That is correct. That is yes, you should obey your parents. All right, one more, back to the middle. All right, let's see. Should you hit your brother or sister? Yes or no? This is a hard one. No, that is correct. You should not hit your brother or sister. All right, so today in our lesson, we're going to hear about when Jesus was tempted and he had to make the decision whether to do the right thing or the wrong thing. So let's watch our video today to see what happens. After Jesus was baptized, God's Spirit led him into the wilderness. Jesus stayed in the wilderness for many days. He prayed to God and thought about God's plan for his life. Jesus did not eat anything while he was in the wilderness, and he was very hungry. 
the devil came to tempt Jesus. He tried to get Jesus to do wrong things. The devil said, if you are really God's son, tell these stones to become bread. If Jesus used his power to turn the stones into bread, he could eat the bread. Then he wouldn't be hungry anymore. But Jesus said no. He trusted God to give him what he needed. Then Jesus said, this is what the Bible says. Man must not live only on bread, but on all the words God says. Jesus did not sin, so the devil tried again. He took Jesus to the top of the temple in Jerusalem. The devil said, if you are really God's son, prove it. Jump off the top of the temple. God will protect you. Then the devil said, the Bible says God will order his angels to keep you safe and they will protect you so that you will not even trip on a stone. Again, Jesus said no. Jesus knew the devil was trying to trick him by misusing God's words. The devil was being foolish. Jesus said, the Bible also says, do not test God. Finally, the devil took Jesus to a high mountain where they could see land stretched out far and wide. The kingdoms and the land were great. The devil said, look, I will give you all the money and power of these great kingdoms. All you have to do is fall down and worship me. Jesus said, no, go away. He said, the Bible says, only worship God and only serve God. So the devil went away. Angels came to help Jesus and serve him. In all of these things, Jesus never sinned. The devil tried to get Jesus to sin, but Jesus never sinned. Jesus always did the right thing. Jesus died on the cross to rescue us from sin. When we are tempted to sin, we can ask Jesus to help us say no to sin. As you saw in our video today, Jesus was tempted by Satan, but Jesus chose to do the right thing because he was perfect and he never sinned. So we are tempted just like Jesus was. And we can call on Jesus and pray to him to ask him to help us when we are tempted so that we can do the right thing. We're so glad that you joined us today and we hope to see you soon. Hey, Grace Life, go ahead and turn in your Bible to Psalm 16, Psalm 16. Uh, while you're turning there, I, I want to let you know that next week we're going to get back into the book of John. We'll be starting in John 10. We're actually going to refer to John 10 uh, a little bit in today's sermon, kind of setting up the, the scene for the next couple of weeks. Uh, but today I wanted to look at a a psalm that's been on my heart and particularly one verse and, and just share with you uh, the richness of God's grace that's founded on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So let's read Psalm 16 together and then we will pray and get into our time in God's word today. Let's read Psalm 16. It says, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, You are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. They, their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also, my heart instructs me. I have 
Set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. May God bless the, the reading of his word, and let's pray together this morning. Father God, I, I pray that as we study this psalm out, that you will tune our hearts to the riches that we have in Christ Jesus. I pray that our lives will be marked by delight in all that you have graciously given us through Christ Jesus. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll convict us where we seek other joys and other pleasures and seek other means of enjoyment outside and apart from Jesus. I pray for those listening today that they will hear the text and that they will respond to it. And it's in your name we pray, amen and amen. This past week, the global population around the world passed 7 billion, 777 million, 777,000, and 777 people. That's 10 sevens if you wanted to keep track. 7.7 .7 billion people that are now walking the uh, face of this earth I really should say 7.7 .7 billion people that are confined to their homes while we're just trying to social distance from one another. If you break down just that stat and just continue to look at the, the global population, every day there are 360,000 babies born on average. 360,000 babies born. On average, there are about 150,000 people who pass away into eternity. If you break that down even more, you'll see that every second of the day, there are four babies born. And every second of the day, between one to two people pass away. Since I've started preaching close to a thousand babies have been born. That's incredible to think about that. And to think about the people that have passed away. It really shows us, I think, just the, 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 the end cap of life. So much happens between the moment that we are conceived and the moment we take our last breath. I think that's why we put so much emphasis on a baby's first words. Because it points to a life of um, expectations. So we, we, we remember as parents our baby's first words. And it's been scientifically proven. All right, This is scientifically proven fact. That a baby's first words will always be dad, dad. Or daddy. Or dad. No matter how aggressively um, intentional the mom is in making sure that baby says mama. All right, I know mamas, you've been, you look at that baby for months upon months, hours at a time, just saying mama, 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 over, over and over and over again. Dad walks into the living room, baby turns to dad and says dad, dad, right? That's baby's first words. And it's just the beginning of what we hope is a life of, of joy and happiness. But we know there's coming a point when we will take our final breath. Some, it's unexpected. For others, there's a time where we get to lay in our bed and think back on life as we prepare to enter eternity. I think that's why we're so captivated by final last words. Martin Luther, the German reformer who stood in great opposition to the Catholic Church, 
and nailed his 95 Thesis on October 31st in uh, 1517, I believe is that date. He nailed these theses to the All Saints Church door, said on his deathbed, or, or was asked on his deathbed by his good friend, Justice Jonas, who asked him, do you want to die standing firm on Christ and the doctrine you have taught? And the story is told that Martin Luther, who was weak and tired and knew he was going to die soon, yelled out in joy, yes, I will stand firm on Christ and the doctrine that I've spent my life teaching. See, we look back on life and look at the things we accomplished, maybe the dreams we missed, the hurts, the joys. And then we start our life with parents and loved ones looking in hope to the future. So much happens between that little dash mark that separates our day of birth and our date of death. And what I want to encourage you today is to find joy in the midst of those two dates. To have your dash mark marked by a life of joy. And I think in this time that we're in, dealing with a coronavirus, it's caused us to pause and just reflect on life. Uh, Solomon even mentions this in Ecclesiastes, referring to funerals, that funerals are good because they cause us to reflect on life and death. And this virus has caused us, many of us, to do the same thing, to just evaluate what's important, see what is necessary, hold close to our loved ones and the uncertainty of the day. And it reminds us of how the Bible in James 4 talks about that life is a vapor, that it's gone in a moment, that we look back and we ask, where did the time go? We also know that life is a vapor when we have no idea when we will spend our last day on this earth. And I think that's why Jesus reiterates in Matthew 6 and says, hey, don't be anxious about the future, about tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. It doesn't add anything to your day. It doesn't You can't add an hour to your day. Don't be anxious. Don't worry. It's appointed to every man is going to die. That's coming, so don't worry. But worry about what God can do with your soul. And then Psalm 90 is just a call and, and, and a prayer to God that says, just, Lord, teach us to number our days. If life is a vapor, then teach us to count the days and make them count. Teach us to number them and enjoy them and enjoy the life that we have in Christ. And as Paul echoes in Ephesians 5, that we are to redeem the time that we have. So most of us have been asking the question, a lot of people asking the question, not just now, but even before, and will in the years to come, what do I do with my life? What do I do with my life now? If you have kids at home with the, with, from school, or if your job changed, or life is uncertainty, you ask the question, what do I do with my life? I, I, my heart hurts for our high school seniors hurts. I can't express how sad I am for them, knowing they're missing their proms and their seen, the last months of their senior years, and most likely graduation, and uh, just all of that that we look to in life as celebration. And they're asking themselves, what do I do in life now that it's been flipped upside down? But that's not necessarily the question we should be asking, whether it's a high school senior or it's someone in the middle of life, or you're asking that question after uh, you've retired. What do I do with my life now? That's, I don't think that's the question we should be asking. I think the question we should be asking is, who is at the foundation of my life? 
as a Christian, that question is, is Jesus the foundation of my life? Is Jesus the one I stand on? Because if we ask the question, what do I do with my life now? It causes us to look to things in which we try to stand on. We want to find a good job that will provide good benefits and good paychecks and great vacation days and security. Good things that we should pursue, but we've seen in just the last few weeks that that can be taken from us in a second. The reminder that life is a vapor. And when we ask that question, what do I do now? Oftentimes we look for things that are unable to hold us up. So for the Christian, we are to ask, what is the foundation of my life? Is Jesus the foundation of my life? In John 10, verse 10, Jesus is, and we'll get into this in a couple of weeks. I just want to bring, reference it here. Jesus says the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I come to give life, to give life abundantly. Jesus is calling for us to see that when he is the foundation of our lives, when the death and resurrection of our Lord is what we stand on, knowing that it is a a firm, secure foundation, that the life that we live in Christ is abundant. Now, when we hear Jesus say abundant life, do not think prosperity, wealth, um, good health, money, materials, a great house, good relationships. Don't think of earthly things. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. If that's what he's talking about, then he is failing millions of Christians around the world who are living in poverty, with disease, who have uh, difficult family lives, who've been hurt and harmed. And that doesn't mean, the abundant life does not mean prosperity on this earth. It's referring to the riches and blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. And the basis of this, the reason Jesus can give the abundant life is because he gave his life for us. That way, when He died and rose again for our sins, for those who believe in his perfect life and believe in his perfect substitution for us and believe in his sacrifice. We will have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life and we've been promised an abundant life. Paul says in Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If God has raised Jesus from the dead and has promised us the abundant life, he will also graciously give us all things. This just helps us as Christians to understand we were not just saved from something. We were not just saved from our sin, from damnation in hell from God's wrath, but we were saved to something. We were saved to holiness. We were saved to righteousness. We were saved to the abundant life with the blessings and riches of Jesus Christ. And here's where I think many of us as Christians, especially those of us who have been walking this Christian life for a long time, we've become bored with Christianity. Maybe we've lost a sense of of joy in Christ. Or maybe you're on the uh, other side of this where you think um, Christian life is boring and drudgery. I want to tell you, whether you're a Christian that's in just a little stale state right now or you're uh, not a Christian, you're looking at the life of a Christian as boring, The Christian life is not a life of drudgery. It is a life of delight. A life of delight. So let me phrase it this way. Christian, even non-Christian, if God gave you perfect health, he's 
guaranteed you, you will be protected from the coronavirus. Using the example that's very right in front of us right now. Would you, let me rephrase, if God protected you from the coronavirus, but he did not give you himself, would you be satisfied? Would you be satisfied with health only but no God? Would you be, if God gave you the amount of money to have earthly security, beautiful home, a wonderful family, a great job, great vacations, but he did not give you himself, would you be satisfied? The answer, Christian, is no. For those of us that have lived long enough, we know that the things of this earth are fleeting. Now, I mean, if you just watch kids a little early on, if they open up a Christmas present, they, they open up this present, they tear it apart, they look at the toy, and they're more fascinated by the wrapping paper that just reveals a little glimpse that we are not satisfied with the things of this earth, that only God himself will satisfy us. And Jesus has said, I am going to give you a life and a life abundant. And the abundant life is more of Jesus, more of him. So how can we have this abundant life? How can we have this life where we are secure in knowing that God is the foundation of our life and his resurrection, raising Jesus from the dead, he's graciously given us all these things. How can we know that the riches and blessings of Christ that we have in him, how can we know we have them? How can we live out our dash marks for the delight in God? So let's look at Psalm 16, especially verse 11. This is a wonderful and beautiful verse. David says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, the fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now, when David is writing this, he writes this from his own perspective, but he is actually prophesying for the coming Messiah. And Peter references this in Acts 2. And in beginning in verse 22, Peter, who denied Jesus and then was restored by Jesus after the resurrection and then um, wrote a couple of letters, this Peter, on the day of Pentecost, he's filled with the Holy Spirit, says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you, by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, and Peter's about to read for us, uh, verses 8 through 11 in Psalm 16. He says, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the path of life. In You have made known to me the path of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Peter continues on, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us this day, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he would not be abandoned to Hades nor do, let his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Psalm 16 is pointing to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
we, when we read verse 11, we read it in light of the resurrection. That verse 11 is only possible because of the resurrection. Resurrection, the abundant life that Christ has given us is only possible because of the resurrected life that he has. How do, how do we have this abundant life? Through the death and resurrection. So we go back to the question. It's not what do we do with our life, but who is at the foundation of our life? Because here's why this question and that distinction matters. When we say, okay, Jesus, his death and resurrection, what he has done for me in my place on the cross, and I believe in this, and I believe in him that my sins are forgiven and that I have an eternal life, and I believe this promise that he is going to give me the abundant life, and that he was, God will graciously give us all things that he has said. Not an abundant prosperity life on this earth, but an abundant life in Christ for all eternity. How, when we set that foundation up, then that leads us to understand and look forward to the second question. What do I do with my life now? So when we understand that Jesus is the foundation of our lives, we can then say from verse 11, okay, God, because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, you will make known to me the path of life. You will make known to me how to have the abundant life in you. You will help me see that earthly possessions, worldly goods are not the abundant life, but the abundant life is in you. You've promised to give us the abundant life through Christ Jesus. And also, you've said in Romans 8, you will graciously give us all things. David reiterates here in verse 11, you will make known to us that path to life. Not just to eternal life through Jesus, but the abundant life through Jesus. And then as we get to know on that path, we will see that that path leads to the presence of God. And in the presence of God, we find the fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. The idea there is it's like filling up a cup and pouring it out and just overflows of joy. It's something David refers to in Psalm 23. My cup runs over. I'm so full. I can't add any more. It just keeps flowing out of me, this joy that I have because I am in the presence of God, only made possible because Jesus' righteousness that's been placed on us because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus walks us into the presence of God and says, my righteousness is on him. And then in the presence of God, we find the fullness of joy. Tell me one thing in this earth that's brought you fullness of joy. I mean, there are things that we have found joy and happiness in and pleasure in, but not true fullness of joy that we have in the presence of God. God says, okay, I'm going to make, you, I'm going to make known to you this path of life. You're going to, in my presence, you'll find fullness of joy. It doesn't say in, in this you'll find fullness of joy, in this you'll find fullness of joy, in that you'll find fullness of joy. No, it's in the presence of God we find the fullness of joy. God's leading us there and making that known to us. Then, as we continue to be made known this abundant life, that at your right hand, God, are pleasures forevermore. This line and this verse packs so much wonder. David is saying to God, God, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And Paul says in Romans 8, 34, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that who was raised. Not didn't just die, he rose again. Who at the right hand of God, who is at the right hand of God interceding for us. We know that right now at the right hand of the throne of God sits our King Jesus. And David says, God, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. 
See, the abundant life, we take and think it's only for this earth. But when Christ is referencing that and saying that, he says, no, 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 the abundant life is not just for the here and now, but it's for the later future, when forevermore you will find pleasure in me. There is nothing more wonderful and pleasurable than Jesus. At your right hand, God. We find pleasures forevermore. And this is what God is making known to us. His simple outline in verse 11 reveals to us that God graciously gives us all things because of Jesus Christ, as Romans 8, 32 said. And part of that is the giving of the abundant life, as Jesus said in John 10, 10. The rest of Psalm 16 gives us just a glimpse, a small glimpse, at some of the blessings and richness and riches that we have in Christ Jesus that lead us to find the fullness of joy in the presence of God and help us find pleasure in Christ forevermore. Eight things, eight eight riches and blessings that I want to share with you. It's not... Uh, the, the abundant life is not less than this, but it, it's definitely more. I just want to look at Psalm 16 now. So much riches that we have in Christ Jesus. First one, in Christ we are preserved. David says in verse 1, Preserve me, O God, for in you I find I take refuge. There is this hope that we have as Christians, that we are secure in Christ Jesus and preserved for all eternity. That the one who is holding our salvation together is not us, it is Jesus. And Jesus says in John 10, that nobody can take you out of the Father's hand. That nothing can take us out, take our salvation away. Romans 8, towards the end of that chapter, Paul says, what can separate us from the love of God? There's a list and it means, it ends up, he's saying nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not even a coronavirus, not even economic hardships, not even family struggles. Nothing can separate us from the love of God because in Christ we are preserved. We find our refuge, not only for our salvation in Jesus, but even for our, 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 our sustainability in this life. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. What a comforting hope knowing that when we sin as believers, and when we repent, confess, God, we've sinned against you, we're turning from that, turning towards holiness. That God doesn't say, get out of my family. He doesn't say, oh, no, no more. He is gracious. He forgives us. And he preserves us. And not nothing can take us out of his hands. Secondly, in Christ, we are made righteous. 16 to, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Romans 4 shows us that one of the beauty, beautiful aspects of being in Christ is that his righteousness on place is, on, is, is placed on us. And part of being a Christian is understanding I have no good apart from Jesus. Like, we are depraved, sinful men and women. We are not good. Only Jesus is, and his righteousness is placed on us. And we sit back and say, one of the wonders and riches of God's grace is that he is good. And his righteousness is on us. And apart from him, we have no good. In Christ, we are preserved. In Christ, we are made righteous. Third, in Christ, we have a family. I could spend so much time on this verse when David says, as for the saints and the land, they are the excellent ones, and in him I find and in them I find all my delights. God has given us a church family. 
In a time like this, when we can't see each other face to face, we can't hug each other and, um, and be with one another and find our delight and encouragement one another, we miss, we're missing out. We miss this. This is why I really want to encourage you to get into the virtual life groups that we have right now. We need the encouragement. We need the face-to-face, -face, whether it's via Zoom or FaceTime or, or what have you. We need the community. You need people to see the wonder and delight of Jesus working in them. Don't, don't say, I don't need the group. I don't need them. And, and, and just think that you're too good for them. Like the, the, This is not the church. The church is finding delight in one another. We're a body fit together perfectly for the work of the ministry. We need one another. I've been encouraged by how many of you have joined into Life Group since all of this has happened. But I want to encourage those of you who have not come to Life Group during this. Some of you have been at Life Group for too long. There's no better time now than to jump back into group during all of this and find the delight and beauty of the church, which is a wonderful gift by God for us. Fourth, in Christ we have freedom. David says in verse four, the sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply, and that he's not going to take those offerings and put them on his lips. What he's saying is there is a freedom that we have in Christ. These people are running after sin and idols and, and false gods, and, and they're just and it's giving sorrow to them. Jesus is saying, no, or David is saying, I'm not, I'm not chasing after them. I find my delight in you, Christ, because I'm free. I'm free. Remember that you are free in Christ Jesus. He's freed you from your sin and he's freed you to live for him, to find your joy in him. Fifth, in Christ, we have a beautiful inheritance. We talked about this last week in 1 Peter 1. David mentions in verses five and six that um, it's more this beautiful inheritance is far greater than the, the portions of land that he has received. He's referring back to the nation of Israel. God promised to give them a, a part of the promised land and he broke it up into 12 tribes. That's what this is referring to. And Jesus, or David is saying, Jesus, you're more beautiful than that. My beautiful inheritance that I have is you. And Peter tells us in 1 Peter that we have an inheritance that cannot be destroyed, an eternal life that can't be destroyed. All the, the wonders that we have as heirs to God the Father cannot be taken away from us. We have a beautiful inheritance. Verse uh, number six, in Christ we have a teacher. Verse seven, David says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel and in the night also my heart instructs me. David is referring about how the Lord leads him and teaches him and counsels him and helps him. What a beautiful gift God's word is to us. That God teaches us how to know him. He teaches us um, the wonder of salvation. He teaches us how to live holy. In Christ, we have a teacher. The Holy Spirit takes God's word and, and helps us grow in our understanding of who Christ is and how we can have the abundant life. So get in your Bible daily. Read it, learn it, study it, memorize it, pray it, meditate on it. Because the Lord is teaching us and we have a lot to learn. Seventh, in Christ we have a stable guide. From the CSB Study Bible, in legal context, the person who represented the defense of another was at the right hand. In military context, the soldier protecting his comrade was at the right hand. In other words, David says, at my right hand is a guide, one who can walk me into the presence of God as a legal representative. And Jesus says, hey, he's with me. My righteousness is on him. And God says, welcome in. And then when we face sin and temptation, we have a guide in Jesus who's ready to fight with us and fight for us and who is with us always. David says, we have a wonderful guide. Finally, in Christ, we have eternal life. Verses 9 through 10, therefore, after all this is said, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. 
for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. For let your Holy One see corruption. We know that David is referring to Jesus here. And when we look at the death and resurrection of Jesus, it makes possible for us to have eternal life. In Christ, we have eternal life. For all of eternity, we will be in the presence of God, finding fullness of joy, and seeing the Son of God who sits at the right hand, finding pleasure in Him forevermore. In Christ, we have eternal life. Jesus said in John 10, The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I come to give life and life abundantly. And too many of us are letting sin, letting circumstances, letting different situations steal our joy that we can have in Jesus Christ. And Christ has said, hey, that dash mark between your your birth and your death, for those of you that are in me, you will have the abundant life, not just in our life here, but in all of eternity. There's a song that uh, we'll share with you this week. It's called My Worth Is Not My Own by Keith and Kristen Getty. It says, my worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose or pride and shame, but in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, the wellspring of my soul. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. Our question, question I want to encourage you to ask today is Jesus the foundation of my life don't ask the question what do I do now what's next what's coming stop and ask the question is Jesus the foundation and when we look and see that because of the death and resurrection he is the foundation that we firmly stand on And from there we can see that God will make known to us the path of life. And that's a path of life where in the presence of God himself, we will find the fullness of joy. That leads us to finding pleasure in Jesus forevermore. Forevermore. Let's take three minutes to respond to God's word today, and then I'll come back with just a few important announcements.
Thanks for tuning in to today's online service of Grace Life Church. I hope it was a blessing and encouragement to you wherever you are. You can find more information about our church by going to thegracelifechurch.org. And I hope and pray that when we're able to gather again in person, that we get to meet those of you who are watching us for the very first time. We're here to serve you and here to help you and help you grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. So go to thegracelifechurch.org and let us know that you watched today's service. Normally in our service, now is the time that we would take the opportunity to worship God by giving back to him the financial blessings that he has given us. So I want to encourage you to give back, to, to give to the mission of the church so we can continue to make disciples who make disciples and to make disciples around the world. You can give three ways. First, you can give online at thegracelifechurch.org slash give, and you can select any fund to give to, whether it's a general fund or our relief aid fund. Second way, you can mail a check or your offering to Grace Life Church, P.O. Box 250, Middleburg, Florida, 32050. And you can also text any amount to 84321, and you can give from any device, anywhere, um, when the Holy Spirit leads you to give. And I want to just say thank you for those of you who have been faithful in your giving so we can continue to make disciples who make disciples. A few announcements coming up. Tonight at 6 p.m. I'll be going live on Facebook, um, just answering questions. I want you to submit some questions to me this afternoon, all right? So submit your question, email it to us at info at thegracelifechurch.org. Ask me anything, all right? And I'll try to answer it the best way I can. If um, it's a question I can't answer right away, I'll get back to you this week, all right? So join us tonight. We're going to have a time of devotions. I'm going to share with you some things that um, I've been reading and, and listening to. So I'm, in, I'm looking forward to that. I've enjoyed these Sunday night lives with you all. And then Tuesday at 12.30 p.m., we are starting our Tuesday lunch Bible study through the book of Philippians. And I want to encourage everyone who's watching to join us for that study. You can go to thegracelifechurch.org slash Philippians and find the Zoom link there and the information necessary uh, for the Bible study. So that's Tuesdays beginning this Tuesday, uh, April 21st at 1230 p.m. And then this Friday, April 24th at 6.45, we'll, we'll have our Biblical Theology Workshop for Women. We'll resume that um, this week. So ladies, make sure that you've read part one. And it'll be a Zoom call. Uh, so grab your coffee that night, get your stuff ready, find a place that's quiet and where you can study and listen. And if you missed the first one, we want to invite you to join in the next one. All right, so make sure that you are there for that. I love you guys. I really hope to see you in a virtual life group this week. And don't hesitate to um, schedule a Zoom call with me. I'd love to meet up with you face-to-face -face this week just through technology, just check in, see how you're doing, pray for you, chat, and just hang out. So schedule a time this week and let's get together and pray. Hope everybody has a great afternoon. Share this video with your friends and family. God bless and Lord willing, I will see you very soon.